Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog. And today we have a Spider-Man issue to talk about. And the reason I'm talking about it is because it's a return of a character that actually ties into Eddie Brock and Venom in, uh, in a very specific and important way, which is uh, Amazing Spider-Man number 44, The Return of the Sin Eater. Apparently the original Sin Eater too. Uh, we don't know the full details. We're still, you know, uh, peeling back the layers. I think next week or the week after, there's going to be a book coming out called uh, Sin Eater Rising or something like that. It's like a one shot and it's like a five dollar our book I'll, I'll definitely pick it up and we'll talk about it next week uh, but I guess that's gonna help set it up more and, and you're gonna learn the backstory of how this Sin Eater came back uh, from the dead and uh, it's what we do know is that it's been brought back by Kindred so Nick Spencer is the writer of this issue and uh, and I also had to write the names down for Kim Jacinto and Bruno Oliveira who are the artists on this book and this is and I got to be honest with you I'm a little behind on some of the Spider-Man stuff I own everything in digital form in trade paperback form up until the um I think volume five or six whatever the one after oh the Spider-Man one 2099 so I think that was volume six or seven so I own all the way up to that and then I read the J. Jonah Jameson podcast issue but the um the one they did recently with Boomerang and the Monsters Underground I I missed that so there are some things in here I might not understand or get so if you do read the book and you want to fill me in on stuff please do in the comments to help educate me and anyone in the comments that is curious to know more about this book because uh, there might be some beats I miss. But uh, but basically what happens is Kindred is this villain that Nick Spencer has been building up since issue one. I personally do not like how long this is taking. This is the only negative thing I have to say about Nick Spencer's run. I like what he's doing with Peter. I like what he does. I like that he's trying to give Peter a life outside of the Spider-Man costume. That's It's so hard. I feel like so, a lot of writers just don't do that. We, I was talking to my friend Gene, who was on my Parasite podcast first episode, and we were talking about Spider-Man the other day and, and other characters in general, and how it seems more and more and more writers are getting away from the secret identity thing, and they're just like, whatever. And I think this is a post Tony Stark Iron Man 1 world you know, after that movie came out and it was just like hey I am Iron Man it just like people stopped having secret identities a lot and they and they stopped writing it and making that a focus now there are some characters that do like Miles and stuff like that so there's still characters out there that do the writers do try to handle that balance but I feel like a lot of them they don't I mean Superman just revealed his secret identity willingly to everybody um so it's just, I don't know, it's one of those things where it's just, I, I, I can see where my friend Gene is coming from, and I, I tend to agree, where it's like uh, writers just want to just write the superhero stuff, and they put the, the, the regular life stuff on the back burner, and to me, you can't have one without the other, you, you know, it's just to me anyway. A superhero has to be a part of humanity in order to save humanity in my mind. Uh, and so, but that's what Nick Spencer's doing is he's playing into that. Like, hey, he has a point in this book where he has Spider-Man admit to himself, uh, to Mary Jane over the phone, he's telling her like, and that's what I love. He's been rebuilding that relationship too, because at this point I'm just like, I want to see Peter Parker happy. I want to see him married again. I, you know, if whether he has kids or not, you can build up to that later, but I want to see him happy. Like I'm getting so tired of seeing this guy just uh, not happy at all. He, he, you know, he finds maybe a love interest, but it's, you know, it's Dr. Octopus in his body finding a love interest. Uh, it's not really Peter. And then Peter, you know, has this back and forth with Mary Jane and then Silk and Black Hat and all this stuff. And none of those things are, filling that hole inside Peter Parker that that where Peter Parker just needs unconditional love he gets it from uh, Aunt May a lot uh, but but I feel like he needs it on a different level from someone else because ever since I've known Peter Parker he's been either in a relationship or married I grew up you know in the late 80s and into the 90s and he was married to Mary Jane and it was awesome I liked seeing him as a, a married guy because it made me feel like he at least had something in his life that was you know, that he was fighting for and he was working towards and he was working to be a better husband, a better, you know, uh, everything, a superhero person. Um, and so when they take that away, I hate it. So I like what Nick Spencer's doing with Peter. He's, he has Peter admit to Mary Jane. I hate that I've over the years have been more Spider-Man than Peter Parker. Um, I have a reason every day to wake up and put the mask on. It's to help people, but I would like a reason every day to come home and take the mask off. And I think that's where I need you, Mary Jane. And he shows a wedding ring and he wants to marry her again. So I hope this happens. I hope he proposes to her. I hope she says yes. And I hope they do a real wedding issue. And it's freaking awesome um, because screw Marvel for ever undoing that wedding and that love just to save Aunt May. Aunt May would, I've always said this, she would kill Peter Parker if she knew, she'd be so disappointed in him if she found out that he made a deal with Mephisto to save her life. That That is not what Aunt May, that's not the man who Aunt May raised, not at all. So um, so I like seeing this, this progression. Um, and then I also like Peter Parker at Roommates, you know, he had a Boomerang and stuff like that. I thought that was all cool. I think Nick Spencer's doing good. 
So in this one where he's bringing back Sin Eater, Sin Eater is the guy who was the serial killer at the time um, named Stan, and he killed police officers, including Gene DeWolf. And so Spider-Man had to go capture him. Well, meanwhile, Eddie Brock was a journalist at this time. He wasn't Venom. And he was writing stories about the Sin Eater, and he had an informant or, or someone claiming they were the Sin Eater, and he was writing stories about their confessions. Turns out the guy confessing everything was not the real Sin Eater. Um, he just, I think, lived next door to the real Sin Eater and heard him talking at night to himself, and the, he thought it was voices in his head, but the walls were just really thin, and I guess it drove this guy to thinking he was crazy and that he was actually killing police officers. So Eddie made an honest mistake for the most part, but when Spider-Man outed and caught the real Sin Eater after you know Eddie turned in the one he thought was a Sin Eater, um, it made Eddie a laughingstock, and it took away all of his credentials, and you know he got fired. And you know he basically got ousted by New York, and everyone hated him. And uh, he, you know, then he got he couldn't pay his bills, so he got evicted. Um, it ruined his uh, marriage with Ann Wang and stuff. So it's just like, yeah, his life fell apart because of the Sin Eater's actions, you know, and what he was doing, and because you know Eddie made an honest mistake, an honest mistake. So um, so now that Sin Eater's back. I wonder if they'll somehow involve Eddie, because I think that's neat. So Kindred, this character that is just way long drawn out, to me I would have revealed who Kindred was in issue 25 or something, and then you do the big Kindred battle in issue 50, so that way Peter has to live for 25 issues with knowing who Kindred is. Um, this whole thing that writers do, like Tom King, I'm going to make the wedding you know, take place on issue 50, I'm going to make Kindred reveal themselves maybe on issue 50 or 850, whatever the next one, big one that's coming out. Um, they're going to have issue 850 of Spider-Man come out, and the next month issue 50 it's probably going to be two ten dollar books it'll probably be everything kindred related um whatever i don't know we'll see i mean like i said i like everything else that nick spencer is doing in this book i just hate the kindred stuff it's getting so boring um but kindred is the reason this sin eater has come back so it's kindred i guess resurrect sin eater we'll find out more about that in the one shot i guess that comes out next week and so sin eater's back so the book starts off in a dream and kindred is invading peter's dreams and connecting Peter's dreams to other characters. As we learn in the end of this book, we find out that Aranya and, you know, and Spider-Woman and, you know, everyone with Miles and uh, Madam Web and all these characters with spider powers, they're all having the same dreams and nightmares that Peter is, and they're seeing the Sin Eater. And so, uh, so and, and obviously Kindred is connecting it all together. So Kindred seems to be very powerful, for sure. Uh, but I wish we already knew who Kindred was so we can get into building up to the battle of it. But I guess we're going to get both at the same time, which that doesn't feel structurally very interesting to me. Um, so anyway, so Peter is in a dream and he's in a, a, a Overdrive's dream. And Overdrive is, so these are little backup stories that have been happening throughout the book where we'll see moments where Overdrive was like working with the inner demons, uh, Mr. Negative's group. So yay, Mr. Negative, I hope he pops up and I hope Venom fights him, that'd be cool. Um, but yeah, so uh, Mr. Negative, you know, the inner demons are working with Overdrive. They went to Mexico to, to rob some bank or get some money. And then uh, they were supposed to make a clean cut, get passed back over to the US. But uh, I guess the inner demon guys killed some police officers down there. So now the heat is on them. And they were like, okay, well, uh, you know, Overdrive's like, this wasn't part of our deal. I was supposed to just bring you guys safely over to the US. You weren't supposed to kill any cops now that you have. I don't know if I'll be able to get you across. I can't guarantee anything because now that heat is going to be on us, they're going to be extra border patrol and everything. So the inner demons are like, just do what you said you were going to do. And then at that point, a knock comes at the door. They turn around, the door blasts open, and it's Sin Eater. And Sin Eater uh, proceeds to kill them all. He says, "Oh, you're called the inner demons. You you don't have you know you you have no clue uh, you know what an in inner demon really is." And so uh, you know, just referencing himself, obviously. Um, and then he goes and he kills them, and he's like awakening their sins because it's like a nightmare sequence. But there's like they kind of look and make a carnage type monster like all their sins come out of them and make this like red monster thing that look pretty cool uh but then sin eater looks at overdrive and says i can tell there's a struggle in you these were real sinners and i just purged them of their sins and their evil but you seem to be on the fence like you seem to have good in you and bad and he goes so what are you going to choose are you going to choose to be good in this moment or are you going to choose to be you know bad and keep going and be you know keep doing the life you have and so Overdrive's like, yeah, screw you, bud, and jumps out the window, gets in his car, and starts to drive off. And what I think Nick Spencer and the art team here did, Kim and Bruno, like what I think they did really well is the like they did like two or three pages that felt like a real horror movie. Like it's really well executed, in my opinion. Have you seen the movie It Follows? It Follows is about these kids who, um, you know, when I guess when one 
kids it's like a a comment on you know um you know having sex while you're underage like you shouldn't do that or when you're young like you shouldn't do that it's a bad thing that you know so most horror movies have some kind of message like that like you know people who do that will get killed or whatever um so uh so in this and it follows it was a, a you know if you sleep with somebody then the curse that they have gets passed on to you and then you have to go sleep with someone else and pass it on to them. Now, eventually, all those people ahead of you are going to die, and it'll come back to you. But you're, I guess it's it's telling you the more promiscuous you are, uh, the more it'll spread, and then the you know then it'll take longer to get back to kill you. Uh, so what it is, it's this ghost. It, so the curse is a ghost, and it follows you around, and you only you can see it. Only the person cursed can see it, uh, and no one else can. Um, so it, and it can look like anyone or anything. So that's what's happening here with Sin Eater. It shows Overdrive get into his car and. He He's driving and then he looks back and he sees Sin Eater standing in the road and then he pulls over for gas and he looks up and Sin Eater standing inside uh, with where the tenant is where you pay and then he gets back in his car and drives away and on the freeway he's passing an overpass and he sees Sin Eater again so it's and it's Sin Eater's getting closer and closer and closer to him and it's, it's Peter seeing all this through the nightmare uh, that Kindred is showing him and I was like wow that's intense man like that is a really cool horror trope with Sin Eater is he's just like this specter that just keeps showing up and ready to kill you at any moment. And since Overdrive chose, you know, to continue with the life of crime by driving away um, and trying to survive, Sin Eater is after him. So it's, oh, I was like, this is so good. Uh, and then at the end of the issue, like I said, you find out that the dream is being shared by everybody after Peter talks to Mary Jane and has that whole conversation with her. So I thought this was a really interesting issue. Like, I still do not like the Kindred stuff. It's it's long drawn out and long unnecessarily drawn out. I feel like it's being drawn out just to do it on a uh, you know a milestone issue, which I talked about that with Transformers recently. It feels like the reveal of the Decepticons was just building up to issue 25, and maybe that's when Orion Pax will become Optimus Prime or whatever. It's like... It's predictable, and I don't like that because I feel like you're just dragging things out uh, intentionally. And although you may think in your head, oh, this is, I can do this thing interesting, I can do this, I can do that, it doesn't ever seem to come across that way. And I know I'm not the only one who feels that way. I see a lot of people online saying, hey, Nick Spencer stuff's pretty good, I just hate the Kindred thing. Oh, the Tom King stuff's pretty good, I just hate the, the build up to the wedding. I wish they would have just did it already. Um, and then when they didn't, it, that was even more frustrating. And it's just one of those things where it's like, Hey, writers, like, stop writing for Omnibus. Stop coming in with these egos and saying, like, I have a five-year plan on these books. Just come in and say, hey, here's my year or two worth of story, and here's what, what I'm going to set up, and here's where it's going to beginning, middle, and end to an extent. But if, it, if the book sells well, we can go on. Here's other ideas I have, you know, or I have other ideas in, in waiting in, to see how we succeed. I just miss those days. Hollywood doesn't do it anymore either. Hollywood's like, hey, we're going to do three movies at one. We're going to plan three movies. It's like... Make your first movie first, you know, make that first. And then when that's a hit, like Blade, Blade 1 came out, huge hit. Boom, make Blade 2. Well, how are we going to make Blade 2? We killed Whistler and we wiped out all the vampire gods and stuff. Eh, make up a new van. I don't know, you figure it out. Right? That's your job, not our job. That's the the obstacles you should run into. You should It should tap you creatively. It should challenge you. But to drag out a story for five plus years and to come into a meeting and say that, like, hey, I got a pitch, five-year plan. It's such an egotistical thing. It's so bad. And yes, writers should have a little bit of ego because you need that to get the work done and get the job done. But there's a balance. And I feel like a lot of these guys don't. They just get they get patted on the back for mediocrity and it's like and it gets aggravating. But Nick Spencer, he's a good writer, I think overall. I think what he's doing on Spider-Man is solid. I just hate the kindred dragging out stuff, you know, and, and Donnie Cates, I felt like his stuff was dragging a little bit too. Um, like I think Venom Island is a completely unnecessary story, to be honest with you. You could have separated, you could have just had Eddie go to the, the, the Avengers and say, hey, help me separate Carnage from the Venom symbiote. And then they could have got Doctor Strange or somebody and they could have done it and then captured Carnage, the symbiote, put it in a jar somewhere and kept it under lockdown. It's like, how hard would that have been? Uh, but instead we need five issues of just nothing and it didn't even make sense to go back to that island because it didn't even really give eddie that much of the upper hand he still needed the help of dylan to save him so it's just kind of a wash like, i don't know to me it was a waste of paper um but uh but that's what i mean don't drag stuff out just to drag it out just to hit those milestone issues 
tell your story, man. If something big needs to happen on issue 32, then let it. Like, who cares? Like, it doesn't matter. Just keep the story going and 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 don't overwrite. And I feel like that's what's happening a lot. So Nick Spencer, whatever this buildup you have to, I got to be honest with you, I don't even care who Kindred is anymore. I just care that Sin Eater's back. And I'm anxious to and, and interested to read more Sin Eater. So I'll definitely cover this whole story for you guys as it comes out uh, on the show. We'll talk about every issue of the Sin Eater story coming out. But the Kindred stuff, all that other stuff, I don't care about that. We're just here for Sin Eater. And hopefully it does tie into Eddie Brock and Mr. Negative in some way. I'd love to see those characters somehow involved in this story as well. And hopefully Black Cat too. So we'll see. Um, thank you guys so much for watching the show. As always, let me know what you think if you read Amazing Spider-Man 44. If you haven't, go pick it up. I think it's a good issue, especially if you're wanting to know what happens to Sin Eater. I think it's a good book to start on and you can skip the Kindred stuff and just read what's happening with Sin, uh, the, you know, Sin Eater and that horror story montage pages were so awesome. I think that just that and the Mary Jane Peter Parker conversation where he's going to propose to her, those two things were worth it to me, worth the price of admission. Um, so if you're a Spider-Man fan, check it out. Thanks so much for watching the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.